Okay, first, uh, I want to thank the organizers. Um, not only is the science good, but the food is al it's also really good. And uh, the company, too. Okay, uh, my name is Emilia Huerta Sanchez, and I am an assistant professor at Brown University. And um, I'm a population geneticist, and so that means that I'm interested in understanding how both demographic history and natural selection shape patterns of genetic variation. And so in humans, for instance, we know, I would say it's well accepted that our origins are in Africa, and that's supported by evidence from genetic data, as well as evidence from uh, fossil data. And, um, but humans um, af originated in Africa and subsequently they dispersed uh, within Africa and they also left Africa. And when they left Africa, there was uh, likely the populations that moved out uh, that created a bottleneck. After they settled um, outside of Africa, they probably expanded in size. And as they kept moving on, probably also um, shrunk again. And so they migrated all the way into Europe, into Asia, into uh, all the way to Australia, and all the way to the Americas. And in doing so, it's likely that they also uh, were exposed to different environments, such as different diets, different pathogens, and so on. And so it's likely that these different environments likely acted as selective agents that led to many local adaptations. And um, what's exciting uh, right now, I think, um, not only do we have a lot of data sets from modern humans uh, who are alive today, but also from uh, we can get data from ancient uh, humans and also from archaic humans. And so um, in the 70s and the 80s, most population genetics geneticists um, built the foundation, the theoretical foundations that uh, we can now use uh, to build on and to apply to um, uh, these data. And so, um, for example, uh, we know that uh, from the fossil record, we know that Neanderthals lived in Eurasia, and we know that they coexisted. Uh, when humans left Africa, they lived in the same place for a long while. And so one of the big questions is, well, did humans and archaic humans interbreed? And, um, and I guess one, one question that's still unanswered is what happened to the Neanderthals? And so uh, just to give you some info about the Neanderthals, so the first draft of the Neanderthal genome that um, came out in 2010, and that, was, that came from uh, fossil remains identified in a cave in uh, Croatia. And uh, that was a low coverage sequence, low coverage genome. And then uh, later on, uh, they found uh, two bones uh, in the Denisova cave in Siberia. And there, one of the, one of the finger bones was actually, um, they, they sequenced DNA from a finger bone and that genome was quite different from the Neanderthal genome and also quite different from the modern human genome. And so they called that individual um, the Denisovan individual because the bone was identified in the Denisova cave. And so it, I think it's quite interesting that there is no fossil record for that individual, but we have its whole genome. And so you can learn uh, lots of things from, from the genome. And in that same cave, they identified another bone and that gave rise to the high coverage Neanderthal uh, genome, which it's called the Altai Neanderthal, because the cave is in the Altai Mountains. And, um, and more recently, there's been a second high coverage genome, um, also from, uh, from Europe. And not only can we sequence archaic human DNA, but we can also sequence ancient DNA of modern humans that lived anywhere between 100 years ago to, say, 45,000 years ago. And so, this allows us to do population genetics of the past as well. And so um, comparing the genomes of modern humans with archaic humans, uh, people have been able to identify 
small DNA fragments in modern humans that came from Neanderthals. And so there's a lot of methods that have been developed by um, many people, including Sharam, to identify these introgression segments. Um, and so, in my opinion, one having access to all, all to the ancient a bunch of DN, DN, ancient DNA data, um, one of the most important findings, in my opinion, is that population interactions and population and mixtures have been more common in human hist history than previously appreciated. And that's something, um, and so archaic and mixture is an example of that. Um, but even if you look more recently in the past, uh, using ancient DNA uh, from uh, Europe, um, uh, it's now well accepted that there's been at least three migrations into Europe, uh, that being the hunter-gatherers, the farmers, and then uh, people from the steppe. And so if you want to explain genetic, the genetic diversity in Europe, then you need to at least account for these three different migrations. And um, even more recently, of course, we know that in the Americas, uh, due to European colonization, there were a lot of Europeans that moved to the Americas, and also the slave trade also brought a lot of um, individuals from Africa. And so um, what that means is that in the Americas, not only do they have remnants of archaic and mixture, but they also have um, other ancestries. So their genomes are a mosaic of different ancestries. And of course, there's evidence for other migrations. And so um, this map, sh the lines in this map show different migrations that have been um, uh, vetted using ancient DNA data. And so uh, I think this is actually quite outdated now. But um, in general, I would say that a mixture has been pretty important in human evolution. OK. So now I want to talk about how do we detect introgression. So in the first paper um, from um, where, where the first draft of the Neanderthal genome was uh, published, one of the things that it used are these things called ABBA-BABA statistics, or these statistics. And so the idea here is um, that if you have this tree that, it, that sort of explains the evolutionary relationship of these four populations. So here you have two human populations, H1 and H2. Then you have an archaic population, and then you have an outgroup, which is the chimp. And so um, as you can see, the human populations, H1 and H2, are more closely related than, say, the archaic population with any one human population. And so um, if there's been an admixture event from, say, archaic humans into H2, denoted here by this arrow, um, that means that mutations that happen on the archaic lineage after they diverge from modern humans, uh, those mutations will be donated to the modern human population. So here I'm denoting a mutation from A to B. So you can think of A as being ancestral and B as the, being derived. And so um, if you have introgression, then you expect what we called an ABBA pattern. So you have um, H1 has the ancestral allele, H2 has the derived allele that um, that, that individual received from the admixture event. And the archaic also has the B allele, and the chimp has the ancestral allele. And so that would create an ABBA pattern. You could have introgression into H1 instead of H2. And so in that case, you would expect a BABA pattern. So here, the archaic population and the um, H1 population share the B allele. And so um, if there is no introgression, you would expect the patterns to be all the same. So the expectation of the difference of these two patterns would be zero. So just by chance, you would expect the number of ABBA and BABA patterns. But if there is introgression into H1 or H2, then you would expect an enrichment of these sites. And so the D statistics is very simple. Um, you basically uh, just here, the i's are just indicator variables. 
whether you have an ABBA or BABA site. And so you just add, a, you take every single site in the genome uh, and you add these D sites. And so the D statistic is just the sum of the differences and, and uh, the no denominator is just the, the sum of the sum of the, uh, the BABA and ABBA patterns. Okay, and so, um, so the person that developed these, these statistics, uh, his name is Nick Patterson, he just, um, he just thought about this and he said, oh, let's do the D statistic. Um, but uh, later on, Eric Durant, he actually um, used co the coalescent framework, which is a model to, um, to a model used to, to model genetic variation. Uh, he used that, that framework to actually derive the analytical um, expectations of the D-statistic. And so just to give you some intuition, um, uh, to derive those expectations, um, it's going to depend on the coalescence, the coalescence times between different lineages. So if you take a lineage um, from the H1 population, lineage from H2, uh, and one from, say, a Neanderthal, then in order to get an ABBA pattern, you would have to have the lineage from the H2 population and the, and the Neanderthal population coalesced first um, before, say, uh, H1 and uh, the Neanderthal. And so um, in the other case, if there was introgression from the Neanderthal into H1, then you would expect those two lineages to coalesce first. Um, okay. But of course, you, you don't need to have introgression in order to get ABBA and BABA patterns. So you could have something called lineage sorting, where you, just by chance uh, you, get, um, you get these ABBA and BABA patterns. And in this case, that would mean that um, in the first case on the left, left panel, you see that the, ne the Neanderthal and the H2 coalesce first, but, but um, they coalesced in the ancestral population of all three. Um, and so in that case, there was no introgression. It's just shared genetic variation. And so in that case, you would get an ABBA pattern. And in the other case, um, in the other case for the BABA pattern, it would be um, the H1 and the Neanderthal coalescent first in the ancestral population. So in these two cases, there is no introgression, but there's still um, ABBA and BABA patterns. Okay, so using um, coalescent uh, thinking, um, Eric uh, derived the expectations of the D-statistics, and uh, the D-statistics are between minus one and one. And so one would be introgression into one population and minus one would be introgression into the other human population. <laughs> and the expectation of these should be zero under the null hypothesis of no introgression, because by chance we would expect the same number of ABBA and BABA sites. And so this, um, this has been applied to uh, different pairs of human populations. So here I'm showing you the results from, um, from a paper by David Reich. So this was when they sequenced the first low coverage Denisovan genome. Um, and here, um, the, first, the first column, this, these are the D statistics. So these are the values that you get genome wide. So as you can see, they're, they're quite low. They're not very big. Um, and just, just looking at the values, um, it's really hard to know whether um, they're statistically significant from zero. So you have to either do bootstrapping or jackknife to, to determine that. Um, and here you can see that um, when you look at African populations versus non-African populations, the populations that have the largest D values are, population, are the Papuans and uh, suggesting that Papuans have Denisovan introgression, which, which is what has been um, already identified. And so, um, and so the red, these values that are highlighted in red, uh, those are the ones that are statistically significant. 
Um, but you see that, for instance, here, uh, there's a Han population and an African population. And in this case, um, that even though D is bigger than zero, that's not statistically significant. And so that's one way to interpret um, the D, the values of the D statistic. And so um, typically, uh, initially, these, these statistics were computed just looking at one haplotype at a time from each individual. But uh, you can also use the frequencies in the sample. So this is just um, another way to, um, to write the D, the D statistics as a function of the frequencies in the sample. And so this was one way that people have used to detect archaic introgression. And the these statistics are good for detecting, but not for quantifying archaic introgression. And so, but a lot of people are also interested not only in, not only on whether introgression happened, but where the introgression uh, is in the genome. And that's because people are interested in knowing if these um, say archaic variants are in genes or not in genes and see if they have a function. Um, and so for in humans, uh, there's a lot of methods that have been developed to identify these archaic introgressed segments. But um, for instance, in non-model organisms, it's quite hard to, th these methods haven't really been optimized because uh, either there's no access to haplotypes or the low coverage, it's too low coverage. And so people have actually used the D-statistic to identify local regions of introgression in, in, in non-humans. And so this is an example um, of butterflies. So here um, they have the D-statistic on the Y-axis and the nucleotide diversity on the x-axis. And here, every dot here is a window of 5 KB. And the, the different color dots, those are um, the values for, for loci involved in, in uh, making the patterns on the wings in, in butterflies. And so um, what this suggests is that the D statistic, it's actually highly variable. Uh, for instance, on the, for regions of low nucleotide diversity, the variance of D is quite high. Um, and, so, and so their conclusion was that for small genomic windows, a high D value uh, alone is not sufficient evidence for introgression. And so, um, and so just to give you some idea as to why, I mean, it's obvious from here that there's a lot of variance of D and that for when you have nucleotide diversity that's low, you can, um, you can have any value between one and minus one. And so if you think about a window with just one site, um, in that case, um, if you assume that you just have one site in a window, so in this case, n is equal to one, if, you th if it's a derived allele, then P4 is equal to zero. And if it's homozygous in the archaic human, then P3 would be equal to one. And so in this case, D is just a function of two variables. And um, if you plot that, uh, so if you plot the D statistic as a, value, as a function of P1 and P2, you can see what you would expect, that for similar values of P1 and P2, you get D is equal to zero. But in some instances, um, for some values for for some values of p, it doesn't matter what p two is. You still get one. Um, and it, the same is similar for some for some values of p. It does p two. It doesn't matter what p one is. You still get one. And so it's highly variable. And depending on the if you only have one side in one in, in one window, uh, it's going to be really unstable. And so that's another reason why you shouldn't use these statistics for identifying introgression locally. And so, um, and also if you look at the distribution of, of these statistics per SNP, you would see that you have a peak at minus one and a peak at one. Obviously, when you, call, when you add them up, these, these two peaks cancel out, but in a small window, the variance will be higher. Okay. Okay. 
And so how can we improve this statistic to identify regions of um, introgression locally? Well, um, at least in humans, um, introgression uh, is quite small. It's about 2 to 5%. But even though it's quite small, um, it can actually have a very big advantage. In, and so one example of that is um, high altitude adaptation in Tibetans. So in Tibetans, uh, we know that they are genetically adapted, not just acclimated to live at high altitude. And um, when you look at the genetic variation in this gene, for instance, uh, this is a gene called EPAS1. And EPAS1 is a transcription factor involved in the response to hypoxia. So it makes biological sense. Uh, when you look at the variation in this gene, so the, the heat map here, the rows are haplotypes and the columns are SNPs. And so if you see a black color, that means that the haplotype has the derived allele. And if it's gray, then it has the ancestral allele. And uh, these pink ones are the Tibetan haplotypes. And when you look at those haplotypes, you see that there's a common haplotype in Tibet. And uh, that's a high frequency. And what's uh, interesting is that that haplotype is quite similar to the Denisovan haplotype, which is at the top row here. So there's, um, there's quite a lot of uh, genetic similarity at this gene between, say, Tibetans and, and, and Denisovans. And so in my lab, we spent a lot of time thinking about what are the features of adapt adaptively introgressed segments. And by that, I mean um, how, many, how many share mutations would we expect between, say, Denisovans and, and humans on average at a, at a local region, uh, and so on. And so looking at this, uh, looking at this region, one of the things that uh, we can realize is that Denisovans contribute not only derived alleles, but they also contribute our ancestral alleles. So when you have an introgression segment, that introgress segment will have both derived alleles uh, that were not present in, in the modern human population, but also ancestral alleles that, um, that, were, that had been lost, I guess, in the, in the modern humans. And so one way to improve the D-statistic is to use not only the derived alleles, but also the ancestral alleles. OK, and so how would that look like in this case? So in this case, again, we have, um, we have this tree that, um, uh, that reflects the evolutionary relationship of these four populations, but now Instead of having um, the mutation happen on the archaic lineage, now you have it happen on the modern human line lineage. And so that mutation would be fixed. And so if there was no introgression, then both H1 and H2 would have that mutation. But if there's been introgression, then that derived mutation could potentially be replaced by an ancestral allele. And so this would create a BAAA pattern. Um, and if there was introgression from the archaic human into H1, then that would create an ABAA pattern. And so the idea is to use these two patterns, uh, which again, if there's no introgression, we would expect them to be the same between H1 and H2, assuming that the mutation rates are the same in both H1 and H2. In that case, um, the expected difference should be the same. And using the same framework from before, we can actually derive the analytical expectations for the BAA pattern and the ABAA pattern. Um, OK. And so uh, one measure that's proportional to the number of ab a, B, A, A, and B, A, A, A patterns is um, it's the expected branch length. And so in this case, um, this, is, this, this expected branch length is proportional to what we would expect. Um, and so here it's, it's that against the, in, the admixture proportion. And so as we would expect at zero, if there's no introgression, we would expect 
uh, both of them both of them to be the same so their difference would be zero but you see that there's departures once f gets larger um, but for the ABBA and BABA sites, you would expect the same thing, of course. Um, for f equal to zero, you expect them to be the same. And um, what's interesting is that the actual expected difference is the same for um, the ABBA and BABA versus the other one. Um, and um, of course, there's going to be more ABBA and, and more BAA sites and ABAA sites than, say, ABBA and BABA sites. Um, and according to this figure here, and I guess the lines are the theoretical expectations and the points are simulations, um, we would expect, on average, six times more BAA sites, say, than ABBA sites. And when you look at real data, that's roughly what we see. We see uh, roughly 700,000 BAA sites and 100,000 BABA sites. Um, and so, um, and so how do we apply this to the real data? Well, um, so the D statistics is just based on, um, taking the difference of the ABBA and BABA sites and dividing, dividing by the sum. So here you can just add, there's different ways you can incorporate these counts, but one simple way is just to, uh, put this difference of the AAAB and the AABA sites in the numerator and just put the, the sum in the denominator. So one property of the prime is that it will still be between 1 and minus 1. Okay, and so does this work? Um, okay, so just to show you some simulation results, um, we simulated under the model, the tree that I showed you, um, and uh, with human parameters that people like to use uh, for estimates of when humans diverge from archaic humans and when, say, two human populations diverge from each other. And um, when you simulate, um, uh, this is what you get for the D statistic. So this is for, I think this is for a window of 40 kV. Um, and here on the left you have the simulation results when you don't have gene flow, and then you have uh, the simulation results for it when you have gene flow. And as you can see, the um, the variance for the is is actually um, high. And for say f equals 0.1, which is actually quite high, you don't even get that d statistically significant bigger than zero. Um, and so here's what you get for d prime, which is um, adding these ancestral sites, so you to get a, um, a a reduction of the variance, and uh, a, a, and for f point one, you do get that it is statistically significant bigger than zero. Um, so it looks like adding these ancestral alleles or these other patterns does um, help reduce the variance of the d statistic. And so potentially we should be able to use this on, uh, to identify local regions of introgression in non-model organisms. Okay. And so just a few remarks. Um, for, so um, D prime is consistent, consistently small, has a smaller variance than D. Uh, it is more stable because you do have more sites, so you have more information. Um, D, in some cases, it's very likely to detect introgression in the wrong direction. And, uh, but D prime is better at also detecting lower levels of, of uh, gene flow, say, than D. So I think it's a good um, statistic. Um, okay, so now to finish, before I finish, I just want to tell you a little bit of a, another story. Uh, that has nothing to do with these statistics, but it's about um, acknowledging acknowledged female programmers. Okay, so um, so one day, I think it was maybe two years ago. I don't remember when the movie came out. You guys have seen Hidden Figures. Um, so I went to see it with a friend, and um, afterwards we talked and we asked whether there was such a thing in our own field of population genetics. 
And so I told my friend that I remember seeing an article from the 1970s where, um, where in the acknowledgments, um, the author think, and it says, I wish to thank Mrs. Jennifer Smith for ably programming and executing all the computations. Um, and to me, that was surprising because I was a postdoc and I spent most of my time programming and doing computations. And so the fact that this person was not an author uh, surprised me, but I didn't do anything about it until, uh, just to give you another example, um, another paper says, I thank Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Wu, Wu for help with the numerical work and in particular for computing table one, okay? And so uh, the last one is actually from, uh, if you're a population geneticist, you are well um, acquainted, I would say, with this paper, which I read when I was a grad student. It's called, the title is, it's by Watterson, and it's on the number of segregating sites in genetical models without recombination. And so in that paper, um, uh, the author um, computes the expectation for the number of segregating sites, which is important for population genetics because we use it uh, to get a sense of what, uh, by looking at the allele frequency spectrum, say, of a sample, uh, and this is the allele frequency spectrum of new mutations, then you can get a sense of whether uh, the data is good quality or not. So it's a number that we use a lot. But um, I didn't know that there was an acknowledgement for Mrs. Wu. And um, these, these women were acknowledged multiple times, so they were probably good at their job since they were um, often acknowledged. And so with my friend, uh, we wanted to just get a sense of how how often this happened and why these women were, were not acknowledged. Um, and so uh, my friend, her name is Rory Rolfs, she's at SF State and she has a bunch of undergraduate students. So we decided to just look at one journal, Theoretical Population Biology, because this journal was important in the sense that they had a lot of important papers um, that build the foundation of population genetics. And um, we just counted how many women were acknowledged in, in these papers. And so we focused on um, the decades. We went from the 19, 1970 to the 1990s, and we just counted how many acknowledged programmers were female and male, and how many authors were male and female. And so, um, there's not that many of them. Uh, there were also that many. There were not that many papers. But um, in the first decade, there were 17 females and 12 males. And in 1980 to 1990, there were two uh, female programmers and 13 male programmers. And so, um, if you look at the distribution, uh, you can also see that there was a shift. There was a shift around 1980, um, which sort of parallels. The, the change of programming going from being a pink color job, meaning done by women, to um, being a more respected, better paid probably, male dominated field. Um, and in terms of authors, the number of authors actually didn't change in these two decades. And so, um, and so to me, um, uh, what this means is that women have always been participating in, in scientific research. It's just that sometimes their contributions don't get recognized. And I think that's something that um, is not always um, known by the general public. For instance, when I, 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 first, I only realized that programming used to be done by women as an adult, um, even though that was a common job for women, uh, we don't, and in population genetics, I only knew that women were doing this type of work uh, very recently. And so um, one, of, um, one of the things that sometimes I get when people ask me, uh, when I tell people, they say that it, it must have been clerical work. And, um, but it's not just clerical work. We've actually talked to some of these women and they told us that it was not clerical work. 
um, they were statisticians, a lot of them, and they were, they were using programming as a tool. And they were doing um, hardcore statistical analyses, like inference methods. Um, so it was definitely some, a lot of intellectual work in their work. And so um, what this makes us wonder is whether this is something that, a trend that happens in most fields where women have been contributing, but they haven't been recognized because most of their contributions are relegated to the uh, acknowledgements. Okay, and so um, with that, I want to end. Um, I just wanna thank Diego and Leslie who have been working on the de-statistic stuff and uh, the undergraduate students in Rory for the acknowledged programmers. Thank you. that was wonderful. It doesn't go quite deep enough because if you go back to the early days of, uh, you know, around the time when we think about Alan Turing and like right after that, I mean, there are a number of female figures that were key in the early programming days. My big example of this that I think people always forget about is that the entire field of bioinformatics was set up by Margaret Dayoff at Georgetown University, like the Atlas of Proteins, like literally the original Bible of bioinformatics was day off, right? Day off matrices, you know, like setting up the initial scoring matrices, the initial, all the basic work before we even got into all the alignments, you know, the, that was all, you know, a, a, a female professor. Yeah, I think there's been a lot of women, um, but yeah, I don't know why there's not more, um, I don't understand why we don't learn that as growing up, I guess. <laughs> um, question about the bees. Uh, so, have you tried to look at uh, using bee prime versions from modern to early and late? No. Um, I don't know if that would work, but yeah, no, I haven't done that. Yeah, that's a good question. I think F probably uses more sites. We're just using two types of, of, of patterns. Um, but I'm sure there's a relationship that I, we, we could figure out potentially, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think we can go as low as 10 KB for humans if F is big enough. I guess it's the relationship between F and, and, and the size, yeah. I think it depends uh, quite a bit. If you think about the example in general, it does depend upon the divergence time between the RPH. Yeah. Yeah, so definitely it depends on the length of the divergence time between, uh, say, archaic humans and modern humans and the time of gene flow. That's the interval it depends on. So I would say that um, for these butterflies, they're more diverged than, than humans. I mean, Neanderthals are really close to humans, so I think it would work better in butterflies. Yeah, so for just the normal D, I mean, what people normally do, they just sample one allele. Right. Um, uh, 
I assume it was vetted when they did that. I don't know, Sharam, do you know if the, it was vetted? Yeah, I think uh, kind of the, one of the motivations for the piece was um, the fact that you want to see the, the, the red lane twice as a way of guarding against each in the Yeah. Um, so yeah, so in the in the original paper, they actually used these the patterns that I'm using as a measure of um, errors in the in the mutations, um, but uh, not not really. To, they didn't use them as. But there's information in those mutations too. So in those two patterns, but no. Um, I don't know if somebody has done the experiment of of yeah checking how picking one allele at a time would affect the results. Um, Mm -hmm. um, but I guess uh, the mm -hmm. and part of the reason is uh, in many of the analysis, uh, it looks like there is sub slightly subsidies of the mutation. Um, for example, the X is the one that has the Yeah, yeah. Uh, we are planning to apply it at the genome wide level too, um, as well. But um, I, my, I, ex I guess I expect that at the genome wide level, maybe the variance is going to be the same. So maybe we're not going to do that much better. But um, we'll check. Thank you.